This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. We are now on day number three. Actually, this is the second full day. The first day was just the, I say just, it was when we had gone to Poe's graveyard and taken a tour also of Lord Baltimore. But I count that as day one, and so does the organizer, <laughs> Vince Wilson. And so today I am with Joseph Daniels, and he was a person here uh, last night on day two, was the uh, performer and lecturer. Going to be performing, I guess, again tonight, are you, Joe? Uh, that's what Vince tells me, yes. Okay. <laughs> Who all is going to be on the bill tonight, do you know? Uh, Vlad, Paul Prater, uh, I think Mark Strivens. There's uh, several folks that are going to be on the bill tonight. I think they may have just twisted Jeff McBride's uh, arm to do it as well. I wondered about that because yesterday, after his lecture, he was saying, okay, I'm done, I could take a break and take a breath. But he's I, I, I think they're trying to recruit him. <laughs> so him we'll see action. what happens. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, would you miss the opportunity to, no. to try try and twist his arm a bit. I don't think so. Well, while he's here, and, I'm, and he's such a giving guy, and he has been. Uh, would you, speaking, speaking of which, what did you think of his uh, performance, I say performance, his lecture uh, yesterday? Honestly, the uh, the history and theory component of it was, was really fascinating, and uh, the circumstances trying to get all the tech ready for it. I know you uh, contributed with that, and I know, I know he jumped through a lot of hoops to make that happen, so I was very grateful we got a chance to see it the way he envisioned it, and I thought it was uh, it, it was very informative. I, it, it sort of gives you a peek into the overall philosophy of the four ages of the magician. And I also like the way that he had structured that specifically for this group. As he had said in the presentation, I have kind of a standard thing, but it depends upon the group and how what level I think they're ready, ready to listen and learn. So. Yeah, he, he absolutely, you could see where some things he probably wouldn't delve into with with a more traditional magic group. He, he was able to get into more of the esoterics of magic and, and a little bit more of its uh, ritualistic background and it was it was very entertaining and, and seeing how the the different types of magicians were delineated and how there's sometimes crossover between them it was it was uh, really well done and then Kenton Nepper had preceded him with uh, another lecture that had to do really nothing to do with tricks but all to do with presentation and performance uh, Kenton has always been a favorite of mine and he has some really good thoughts in terms of uh, characterization and the way the way to handle um, different types of crowds and approaches that are not not the normal tada that most magicians take in fact one of the techniques he taught was the anti tada which was a new concept me hearing it from him it was a new concept but clearly to some of the people that followed Kenton uh, it was it was uh, pure Kenton all the way what was interesting, I think, of the contrasting the two is how the Jeff McBride appears at a lot of conventions, whereas Kenton rarely attends and performs and lectures at conventions. That's very true. Uh, I, I, from what I know of Kenton, uh, it really has to be a case where he feels his message is going to be best heard by the group, and uh, it took a lot of persuading from Vince to get him here, so I was, I was glad that I was finally able to attend one of Kenton's lectures as opposed to just reading a manuscript. I feel the same way. I feel honored the fact that I have known him as you have for years, but I have not really set in on a a two-hour conversation, or I should say lecture of his. It was great. And he said, I'm going to take the full two hours, and you'll see why at the end. I mean, gosh, that two hours went fast. I can't believe it was two hours. Zipped right by. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. A lot of really good uh, stuff to go take away. And then last night, yours was the first one in, uh, of the convention so far. It actually taught tricks. I mean, you performed, and then you explained them as well. Yes. Uh, I tried to uh, definitely lean into the, the theory component and my background as an actor right. because uh, a lot of it had to do with, with the way to present, the way to develop the character and, and your handling of the audience and how there's a certain play dynamic and I tried to illustrate that through the particular pieces that I structured for the show. Yeah, I thought that was uh, very well done and I like the way also that you at the end walked off as if you were walking off stage as when, like you would normally do at the end of a show. Well, cons considering the, that we left it on, on kind of a tribute beat to someone that's no longer with us, it, it, uh, it was a good fit. And I think that this 
crowd more than most really understands what it takes to stage that kind of thing and appreciate the fact that I went through with all the staging that I normally would if I were performing it on stage. Exactly. With an intimate group like we have right now, it is very familial, if you will, in which everybody seems to be forgiving, like, like when you had a, a faux pas, but, <laughs> but well, it was fine. The, the shocking thing was it's purely magician's guilt because the more people I talk to after the show, is like, what went wrong? I, I didn't, didn't see, see anything. Right. No. You shouldn't have called and attention like, to it. I'm like, you know, this is me just painting a, a bullseye on it. I, <laughs> so most people have no idea what happened. So I'm, I'm really uh, I'm really sitting here going, oh, wow, I wish I hadn't said anything. Yeah, but, and I were having breakfast this morning. He said, "Why did Why did Joe even say anything about it? I mean, we didn't even notice it." No, I, well, I I'm, I knew I was among friends, and exactly. I just I just thought rather rather than take the fun. ribbing that I was going to get, <laughs> regardless, that I'd just go ahead and step up and own it. And then it turns out none of my friends caught it at all. So I, I really I needed I needed not to worry at all. It was good, very good. Uh, uh, interesting, I did not know that you had been on The Walking Dead and died 45 times or something. Is that 20, right? 26, 26. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've done so much casual acting, and I just I lose sight of the fact that for whatever reason I've... I've been able to meet so many people. I mean, I, I think I worked on, I think it was Lauren Bacall's last film, My Fellow Americans. I was on that with her and Jack Lemmon and James Garner and Wilford Brimley and Dan. I, I, it just so many different people. I worked with Rod, Robin Williams and Monica Potter and Philip Seymour Hoffman on Patch Adams. And I've worked with Sandra Bullock a couple of times and Ben Affleck. And it's, you lose sight of the fact that there are are so many people that, cinematic icons yeah that, that but you know i i had lunch with them and we gossiped about nothing particularly important and you you don't realize until you're listing off these names what a privilege i've had being behind the scenes seeing how these people put characters together and how how film and television and, and live theater work from behind the scenes and it's really contributed to my work and i, I have a very very casual, uh, easily approachable style that is is borrowing various elements from the the actors I've been fortunate enough to uh, either study under or witness firsthand. But when you're going from one film to another, you develop a lot of friendships, and uh, again, going back, familial is very much a family. My good friend is a screenwriter, producer, and director of like the A-Team and Walker, Texas Ranger and others, who lives in North Carolina, is now retired, but he used to live in Hollywood, and so we had a thing for a while called Mincing Movie Magic on Wednesday nights during COVID, and that was one of the main takeaways for me, was when he was talking about when he was working on a film or a TV series or whatever, how much of a family that everyone is, and I'm talking about from the lighting guy to the gaffer to the best boy to the uh, makeup person to the actors and directors, everybody is offering different ideas, and it's a family. It's a tight-knit community. I mean, not just community, a family. That's very true, and I stay in touch with a lot of these folks because we, we you know, warn each other, you know, this is coming to your area. You ought to check this out, and, and as a result, I mean, I have... I, I have a limited resume because I was touring professionally as a magician through a lot of this, and so I had to catch the roles wherever I could. But Do central casting, or have an agent? Or? Actually, I never. I, I had an agent, Ken Follows, who's no longer in business, and probably because I was a terrible actor. But uh, <laughs> no. but actually, uh, it, what what happened is I developed working relationships with every casting director in about 500 mile radius mm -hmm. and as a character actor there was always somewhere they could slot me in and I even had a few that I had a close enough relationship that they're like look if you'll just come down and help me gather the hundred extras we're going to need yeah. and, and sort of get them going you, you've got a role I don't know what it is yet but you've got a role so I benefited from just being nice and being available that has a lot to do, I think, with magic in general. Whenever that you are develop friendship with a client, they want to. We like to do business with friends because you get to know them, you're comfortable with them. And the same thing, I think, year after year, they will bring you back as a performer, then as well, because you're a friend. They're going to call you, or if they want to, if their company decides they want to go in a different direction, they might call you and say, "Hey, do you know someone who's a ventriloquist or whatever?" But they're counting on that relationship and your honesty with them that you can make those kinds of suggestions. That was always the case during my career. I was so blessed that uh, 
that I had a lot of good people to emulate, and I got to to apprentice under several magicians and see just the advantages of of being available and being able to say, sure, I'll do that. I you know I don't mind showing your CEO a few private pieces after the show. Just have he and his family you know come around and uh, one hand washing another in the entertainment industry is an absolute vital tool to network. So. Going back to Walking Dead. For just a minute, because that still fascinates me. I've watched it since the first episode and everything. So, were you over one particular season or several seasons in which they made you up as one of the dead? Every season. Every season. Uh, what happened was I, I was uh, originally contracted to do just just one appearance, and and I was going to be killed, and then I would I would that would be on my merry way. But they realized after the series played out over time the zombies were going to become more and more emaciated and so a lot of the actors that had done small parts over the first season they like would you like to come back and what what their intention was was to do um, full head appliances where where they basically cast you in dental alginate down to your shoulders wow. Wow. and it's not a comfortable process no, I they put think so. they put straws up your nose and it goes on and it's super cold but the reaction that happens it's a, it's called an exothermic reaction they told me and uh, in, over the course of the hardening it goes from being like ridiculously cold and and, and wet to being hard and very hot hmm. and when they finally pulled the the thing off my face uh, at the very end, uh, they they cast my entire head, and they had to uh, gel everything with Vaseline because the dental alginate will pull every hair out of your head, and it's a, not a comfortable process at all. But when I came up, I looked around the room because we had started with 18 people, and I went, "Well, you know, thanks for saving me to last." And they went, "No, you're the only what? everybody. Everybody else clawed it off out? their face." about midway through and what it turned out is the process of casting like this is very expensive and every one of those that was a wash cost the company eighteen hundred dollars oh my gosh and so i was the only successful one and she's like well i hope you like being a zombie because you're going to do a lot of it so, <laughs> so you had to do that every time also are you no no, no. Once, the same thing once once that was cast they they did a positive where they would have my head and that way they could build the appliances that were going to go specific on my face before I would even arrive on set, but there is so much involved with that that I would have to be uh, up at 2 a.m. Mm-hmm. in makeup, and it would sometimes take the better part of six hours to to wow. get made up, and then sometimes sometimes it was simpler if I was going to be cut in half midway through, then uh, I would wear essentially a stretchy green sleeping bag up to my waist, or if an arm was going to be lopped off, I would wear a sock up to my shoulder. You know, and they would fill it's in a green the rest. screen kind of a it's, thing. It's a green screen, but it's it's also CGI. They yeah. they were able to use the green to paint out those sections, isolate them, and replace them with the background that should have been right. behind me. Right. So. And so there were several scenes, obviously, in which you must have had a close up. Yes, it's the the uh, title was Hero Zombie, and all hero means in the in the filming industry is it's something featured close to camera. So the zombies that were fifteen to twenty feet away from the camera were sometimes more casually made up, or sometimes it was a pull on mask that had just been spirit gummed around the neck. Yeah. But my appliances were custom built for my face, and I, I had the advantage of having a, an Academy Award winning uh, makeup designer applying my makeup. So it looked pretty darn real. I, I certainly hope in my old age I don't end up looking closer to what they made me look like in The Walking Dead. Now, whenever I see that, I'm sorry to spend so much time for those people who are not familiar with The Walking Dead, but those who are fans. Uh, I, I, I often have thought about that this film like down in Atlanta, Georgia area. Is that right? Dun, Dunwoody, which is just north of Georgia. And they do that because they need to be able to be close enough to the city to do city shots. But we've also got to do a lot of roaming through the country right. and and the main group evading the zombies while we chase them across fields and right. fields and valleys. Yeah. But but I know how hot, humid, and sweaty it must be. I mean, I'm thinking about all these guys like you. I'm thinking all these guys who've got and gals have all this all this prosthetics on them, and they're walking around and and they have to be cool as cucumbers. You know, all day long. You're up in the morning, like you say, at two to to get made up the way you are. It's not like 
some of the other guys who come in and they just get regular makeup. I mean, it takes a couple hours for that, but not like what you have to have applied and everything is done. And then kind of walk around, say, okay, let's shoot this again. And you're walking around fields and you're dragging your feet and everything. And, oh, my gosh, it's got to be. And you're putting up with possibly snakes in the in the place or whatever <laughs> kind of vermin. <laughs> well, they do they do scans. They send people out to do sweeps, and then they send people out to do sweeps to get the the large uh, uh, grass back up so it doesn't look like it's been tromped through. Oh. And they have to do that between every shot because sometimes we we're pursuing the group and then uh, go back to one and then we, we go back and shoot it again. But they have to fluff up the grass so yeah. it doesn't look like we've trampled it down. And uh, it is a hot process. It's especially hot when you're in prosthetic makeup because right. it covers every pore of your skin and, and your skin can't breathe. So I, I knew that every time that I did it, I was going to uh, suffer through bad skin for about a month afterwards. Wow. And it was not it was not pleasant. So I like doing back-to-back contracts where I'd do a week and complete that. And then we'd change makeups and I'd, I'd do a different zombie because almost, almost always, since they were putting so much time, effort, and money, into my makeup, I died in some spectacular fashion. Right. So. Well, you always had the same face. Uh, you said, uh, yes, but it, they, but it, that was that was the reason they were able to use me so many times because when they've got this perfect model of my head that they can build on, they can completely change the look of the zombie. And there are things where where I would put in a what's called a scleral cell. It's a contact lens that fills the entire eye, you, you, and you can't see through it uh, at all. And it was green screened as well. So there were times I was missing an eyeball or missing an ear. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's it's really kind of an involved process. But they were very nice to us. They put us up in the trailers like the celebrities, so we were able to stay air conditioned whenever we were close to base camp. Did you remove your head mask oh, no, or no? No, you had to keep that on. And then uh, the extras that were were uh, working with us quite often, uh, it was like, cut, okay, extras, grab your umbrellas, and then you, you had extras holding umbrellas over our heads. To Could you eat them. and drink through the thing, though? Oh, yeah, yeah. That, was, that wasn't a problem, but you have to be careful. It, like in my case, they they would sometimes do individual painting of my teeth yeah. to make it look like my teeth were rotten, and so there were certain times I could only uh, have liquids, uh, soup or what what have you, because if I chewed, it would have wiped the makeup off my teeth, and I have reasonably good teeth, yeah. so it, which wouldn't have been appropriate for zombie. Okay, well, I, it, this whole thing actually has to do kind of with this conference where we are then right now, as far as presentation and creating a. A persona, if you will, and something that is different and rather macabre and mysterious. Uh, Absolutely. Kind of thing, so. Well, I mean, uh, the, the horror element fits yeah. right in with with bizarre magic, with story-driven magic that has kind of a darker theme. But being on the inside of the process, I mean, I, you, who doesn't want to be in a horror movie? Well, yeah. And I mean, they're lavishing millions of dollars per episode, which is literally like being in a new horror movie every week. Every it's week. just with the same recurring characters, and you yeah. become you become friends with them, and you know yeah. you you have actors who who you rib like uh, Norman Reedus. Norman Norman, I I will never forget. I I can't say because he he uses colorful language, but uh, <laughs> I went to one of my first conventions and I'm like nobody's gonna know me and then I'm like nobody's gonna care and they went you've never been to one of these have you I said no I haven't and uh, so I go in and I'm standing in front of the not in front of the crowd in the crowd and they're interviewing principal actors on stage and I'm just trying to get a feel for Are you in costume with your mask on? on no 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 I was just I was totally out of makeup and uh, no, nobody would recognize me uh, unless I was in the makeup. And so I'm standing out there, and Norman caught sight of me, and he points, and he he said several expletives as far as how many times he's killed this bleep, 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 bleep. <laughs> and uh, I, I ended up having to get on stage because the crowd kind of surrounds you because it turned out, I, once it was over, I'm like, well, you know, because we talked a little bit about the makeup and everything. I said, well, is that it? And they went, well, no, you gotta you got to sit in the dealer's room. I went, well, I, I don't have anything to sell. And she went, come on, honey, you do. And they took me to a table, and I, I swear I'm looking here, and every one of these disgusting 8 by 10s of zombies, colored photographs, it is one of my makeups. And wow. they had, like, at the time, I think they had, like, 14 
different shots yeah. that had been extracted, and they printed them up. And they, I had a handler, and the handler was selling it, and people were coming around and you were posing, <laughs> and I'm signing, and I'm like, nobody is gonna buy this. Nobody's gonna want my signature on something that ugly. They're not gonna hang it anywhere. And the the PA went, well, you'll be sold out by lunch because you've never done one of these, and they're they've been waiting on your signature. And I went, you're out of your mind. And no. I was completely sold out by lunch. Wow. They had to print more. You're somebody. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently, even a non speaking zombie is, is something on The Walking Dead. Was that like a Comic Con or what kind of a. It's, it's very much like what the stereotypical Star Trek convention is. Okay. There are fan panels where the fans get to ask the actors ridiculously yeah. invasive questions about either working on the set or their personal lives or what have you, and the actors try and handle it with as much humor and decorum as they can, yeah. and uh, some of the actors are more playful, and the actors, the all bets are off because the actors can be loose cannons some, some of them love their profanities and I love, I love them and we mercilessly um, teased Andrew Lincoln about his uh, pronunciation of his son's name. The, the, the character's name was Carl, but he's, he's, got br- an he's British, and he, he, he adopted a southern accent that really doesn't exist, and so he called him Coral. Uh, and uh, right. on, the, on the final day when Coral died, uh, we, we had all uh, ethically sourced little pieces of Coral, and we kept, because he, he screams, Coral, you know, yeah. you know. We, we, when we were going off set that day, we kept handing him these little pieces of Coral, and I can't say what he said in return, but it was, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. It was colorful. <laughs> yes, it was, again, very colorful and very British. Nobody would ever know he is, he is as British as they get. <laughs> Well, if you watch the Talking Dead that follows the Walking Dead, a lot of times they they would have had uh, these oh, actors on there, absolutely. and you, you you learn they're from Australia. A lot of English actors on yes. the show. Okay, well, this is not all about the Talking Dead. We're not <laughs> Walking Dead. We're here about talking about the conference, and also good job last night. Looking forward to see your show then tonight too, Joe. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to be on on stage with a bunch of uh, superstars yeah. and magic, so I really look forward to it. This has been a lot of fun. I'm uh, and today we've already had one. Uh, chat that was by Mark Strivings and his was all trick based basically but yeah. uh, some Re- good theory. Really, yeah. really practical stuff and he has really? sourced a lot of stuff that has been out of print or, or just completely unknown for, for in some cases 70, 80 years right. Right. and it, just every bit of it was usable. I, I made so many notes. Yep, yep, ditto. I think I saw everybody kind of jotting down different ideas and things so it was great stuff that he had offered plus he had not only lecture notes but they had a couple of books and things he's written during COVID and has I don't know how many hundreds of pages of each of those books. So one of them on Living Dead. I think he said, "What do you have? Like three hundred different presentations for Living oh, Dead." It was insane. And he said, "And this only scratches the surface, and it makes you wonder what didn't make the book." <laughs> right. He said there are five hundred uh, uh, references in the appendix. It, know, it's so. it just you could never imagine that there were that many out there just for that one right. particular trick. Right. But the the book most of the lecture came from Murky Manifestations is one of my favorite things that that has been put out in the publication market over the last two years. It's a really great book. You're familiar with uh, Rick Mao's uh, book on uh, is it Nightmares? Uh, gosh, I can't remember. The name. Rick Maui has a, uh, a book, and I have done several things from that when I'm doing seances or walk around kind of bizarre types of things. Darn it, what is the name of that? I'm just wondering if... Uh, this book. Uh, I'm, fami- if, I'm familiar with, with his work. I'm not sure which one of the books you're referring to. but a, I'm just wondering if that's similar, perhaps, in nature as far as being practical commercial stuff that I'm, Mark has. Yeah, Mark Mark's has, uh, in some cases, he has full-blown presentation. But in some, it's just like drawing your attention to this little subtlety on a trick you probably already do. Yeah. And all of them are brilliant. And, you know, we, we tend to think of modern creators, you know, as being being the ones that are on the cutting edge but you discover looking back people like like UF Grand and Max Holden and and some of the people that from the 1930s just had brilliant stuff and I right. mean Dr. Jack's stuff is just as practical today as, as it was when he wrote it. And Anneman and others he's referring to? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Ted Anneman. I, it's such a pity that that uh, his his life was cut short because he, he just the amount of material he created uh, in his short lifetime, and uh, some of it's in my act. Yeah. And, and burned bright for oh, a short time. For a very short time. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, Joe, thanks very much. I appreciate your time over here. This has been great. I enjoy your friendship. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, lo- I love the Magic Word podcast. You guys are great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So for the Magic Word podcast, that was Joe Daniels. This is Scotty Allen. The afternoon is still going strong, as is the convention. Here we are on day three. Here we are on Saturday. we still got a full day, to, well, rest of the half a day today and another full day then tomorrow. I'm here with a longtime friend, someone I've not seen in such a long time, very handsome man. Here he is, Hiawatha. <laughs> What's happening, my brother? It's been so good to see you. I was so excited. Oh, I yesterday, I've got goosebumps. Look at me. i got goosebumps. Oh, Just, I love living been around you, man. Oh, man, it was great. <laughs> you, are, you are the shizzle. You're the guy who does everything. You're the one who really, I think, this whole convention should be about because it should be around you you are the ultimate i start to say penultimate but that'd be the next two but you are the storyteller oh, and you teach it, this man. in college stop then too it, don't you stop it man i'm an artist in residence at randolph college and yeah. uh based on the dance program and so i choreograph there i play music for classes i do dance composition co-produce mm-hmm. the dance concert and then do theatrical things with theater and music and it's a beautiful thing. I enjoy what I do. And you've been uh, doing that for 20, well, forever, longer than that? A little bit longer than that. <laughs> well, I mean, but you're only 43, you know? <laughs> yes, 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 43, yes, correct. In vampire years, I mean, that's nothing, you know? <laughs> indeed, man, indeed. So this, you don't go to a lot of conventions, and that's why I don't get to see you. I, go to, I try to go as many as I can, hoping to see you, and I finally got a chance to see you here. Uh, so where have you been as far as uh, magic conventions? You've been kind of invisible for a while. Yes, because I got kind of burnt out for magic conventions, I can admit that. Just kind of burnt mm-hmm. out. Yeah. Sometimes it's redundant, and sometimes you can get a little jaded after seeing so many things. And so I just kind of pick and choose uh, what I go to. I was talking to someone last night and saying in the older days, you know, I go to the convention, try to see everything, everyone, do it. And that's why I'm we got to be friends, because we saw each other all the time. All the time. <laughs> yeah. All the time. And so I'm a little more burnt out than the, than the regular person, because I went to every convention. Yeah. One time I looked back I can't remember how many in one year I'd gone to, and I could not believe it. You know? Well, you were performing. You mean you were just attending. You yeah, were also performing or lecturing. Either, or Yeah, I was either performing or covering it, writing, or... Oh, I've forgotten. That's right. You did write. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. And so I just... I, oh, and I got burnt out. I did you mainly work for Genie or Magic, or would you all... Magic. Have? I was yeah. doing it for um, Magic. For Stan. Yeah. yeah, for Stan Allen. Oh, we had a good time, and I just... I, I got burnt out, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. I understand that. My column ran for about eight years on the convention column, which yeah, we choose every month. You so, know, so good. Yeah, yeah, man. It was so, so, so good. <laughs> I was telling someone last night, and I'm not saying this bragging. I'm just saying the respect I have for you. You're one of the first people who complimented me on two different levels. You you follow conventions. You saw me performing. You wrote about performance, but you also said he's a wordsmith. And uh, I love that word anyway. And when you use it to refer to me, it made me feel really good because I love love to write my writing as much as I do performing and directing. Words have power. Yes, man. It's what I talk about a lot. Actually, the lecture that I'm doing uh, tomorrow night is called Pop Goes the Weasel and, and, and I'm going to talk about the power of words as one of the key points in that lecture because no joke, man. Words have power and we just throw them around so, so flippantly. It, it is. I think it's, it's important that you, you choose carefully what words that that we say. And oftentimes, it's so easy to say something. When you're going to write something, you have more time to kind of think about it, rewrite it, yes. edit it, whatever. Yes. But when we're speaking, you can't call that back. Exactly. You can't call it back at all. But I love to write. Even when I write in Facebook, uh, one of my students was watching me. We had gone to see uh, a major dance company. And as soon as it was over, I wanted to post something. Sure. So I sat in the lobby, and I was writing. And she looked at me and started laughing. She said, you're doing that like you're composing music. And I said, but that's what it is for me. It is. It has to be a flow. It could be just two sentences, but I'm thinking about it. And I go back and rewrite it and look at it before I press send. And then I'll re read it several times more and go back and edit it if I didn't like how it how it rhymed I mean the rhythm of it the rhythm I don't know about you but I suspect you are like me from the standpoint that sometimes there might be something negative that you have to say and I will as a cathartic uh, thing I will get it out I will write it yes. but I won't hit send and I won't hit send exactly but I feel better about having Much put it better down. something is while wow, you would say that I was dealing with the issue recently and I knew that I couldn't say 
all the things I really wanted to say, but I just wrote it all out, wrote it all out, wrote it all out. Then I went back, condensed it, and sent it. Yeah. And I felt so good. It, it really, more people should do that. It's like therapy, really. It is therapy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like you're giving yourself therapy. Get it out, you know. Yeah. Cuss if you have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, now, when are you going to be performing, you say tomorrow night, not tonight? Yeah, tonight I am performing on the ensemble show, and I'm so excited about it because I'm doing an evolution of a piece I've been doing for a while, but it's going to be different tonight, and I'm so happy. Whenever I perform, I love to do something that's going to have me on the edge. I, it, it stimulates me. Mm-hmm. So I will do, always do something that I'm familiar, that's familiar to me, but I I have to add an element that's giving me an edge or I don't enjoy it. And so tonight it's going to be both of those things, something I've been doing a while, but I'm taking it to another level and it's it's going to be a trip. And then tomorrow night is when I'm so honored to be closing the convention, the conference uh, with my lecture. I call it a lecture demonstration and it's brand new called Pop Goes the Weasel. And uh, it's about dispelling some of the... Uh, the myths and 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 things that have become pseudo facts within our field just just tear some of them down and uh, some of them I'm even talking about myself when I talk about them because I've gone through an evolution uh, with my work and I hope that every day that passes in my life I continue to learn something it is we literally should every day of our lives I don't care how day. old our dying day every day man every day that's literally one of my daily meditations is to make sure that every day I learn something mm-hmm. and I will even go to lectures or concerts that aren't my thing yeah. Just so Outside I can, of your yes, sir. Comfort zone, so I maybe. can learn something, yes, mm-hmm. sir. I've done it here. Boy, I admire you for that. Oh, thank you. Well, we should be more of us do that kind of a thing. Oh man, I do it. I That's why you go to art museums, and there are different kinds of uh, artists, you know, thank down you. through time, uh, whether it's abstract or classical or whatever it is. And so this way that you can appreciate that, that or at least understand, there are. <laughs> different colors of the palette. That it is, and that's something else I'm going to be talking about tomorrow night. Pop okay. goes the weasel. <laughs> Dispel this, this, this thing that it has to be what I like. It has to be no. Do yourself a favor mm. and see things. Like, I don't mind saying, please, people don't cringe, but I don't like musicals. Scott, I don't like them. And, mm-hmm. and when I talk about it, actually, one of the acts that I do, I talk about that. And people always are jolted when I say it because they assume you into theater and you like to do and you direct musicals. Yeah. Just because I direct them, I don't like them. I love the music. Um, I love the songs. Um, when I do music, it's, I've arranged so many songs. Right. One of my favorite songs is uh, my favorite things from The Sound of Music. Sound of music sure. But I don't like The Sound of Music. Um, you like Hamilton? No, me either. I, you know, you I, don't. I don't. Oh I, I, I don't care. You know, <laughs> I don't didn't care. It's like Thank I don't you. get it. People, I don't like it, man, for so many reasons. And when I say that to people, they like you don't like Hamilton. No, I don't. <laughs> I watch it all the way through, thinking, okay, maybe there's something else or something. I watch it all the way right. to the end. It's it like, just mm, bothers yeah. me, man. I, I musicals, but once again, the I like the concepts. You know, mm-hmm. you can name a musical, The Wiz. That you name something, it, mm-hmm. they just it just uh, <laughs> and really gets me, Scott. When they are, Scott, are you going to the lecture now? Yes, I am. Are you going? Yes, I am. Did you take no shits or did? <laughs> that, oh, my God. That makes me crazy. People just don't sing like that or talk like that. <laughs> right, 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 right. So forgive us, America. That's right. We're just two old guys, two old farts. <laughs> uh, doggone these young kids nowadays. <laughs> oh, snappers. <laughs> So what, of all the conventions, again, you haven't attended, why did you come to this particular one? Oh, that is such a good question that I, uh, I'm i proud to answer. Vince, who I'd never met but had heard about, and actually uh, he contacted Randy Shine to talk to me. Love Randy. He didn't even know if I, yeah, he's good I people. I had him right? on one of my episodes. I'm going to have to have you as an episode sometime. Oh, would love to, <laughs> would love to. And uh, so they were discussing it, and uh, Randy said, well, you know, he's kind of interesting. Let me <laughs> talk yeah. to her. So, yeah. he, he, uh, Randy, I hope you don't get irritated by this, but Randy, talk to me first. And he said, you know, yeah. this guy Vince is going to call you. Do you mind? And uh, since Randy recommended him, okay, you yeah. know, okay, I'll talk to him. And uh, I immediately liked how he was speaking, and some of my favorite conventions in my life there are three top ones because they were unique. It was Tannen's Jubilee, which to me... Like a Kutcher's or how, long, how far exactly. back? Exactly. Okay. Eggs, you know. <laughs> you know, man. 
Talents Jubilee, which is nothing like it. I think Hank Lee's Concave came close to it, but I still felt it was not Talents Jubilee, but both good conventions, yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, but it was so unique, and, and we used to do things in the late night at Tannins, you know, that were just so incredible, like seeing Slidini close up and seeing him do all this stuff for a group in a suite. Oh, my goodness. Then Factors, yeah, of, of course. course. Of, of course, of course. <laughs> and then the Invocation. With, oh wow! Well. You went back to Tony Andrucci. And, yeah. Yeah. and these were very unique, very unique. And so when he said it's a small grouping, because I am a pseudo germaphobe, I'm also pseudo. Like the whole COVID thing has me all freaked out. Oh yeah. man! And so I take extra precaution. I don't like being around a lot of people anyway. People assume I'm an extrovert. I'm not. I, I can fake it. I, I'm perfectly fine when they say quarantine. Good. I got that. Um, <laughs> Perfectly fine with not being around people. I like being in front of people because mm -hmm. I can keep my eyes on them. You got an and, invisible and wall. Perform. Yes, sir. But you won't see me around. That's another reason I don't go to many conventions. I don't like being around large groups of people. Like, since no joke. And people are stunned when they hear me say it and they think I'm lying. But I can fake it. I can fake it. And so here, I knew it was going to be a smaller number of people, mm. opportunities like this. I've seen so many people I haven't seen in years, like you. We can sit down, and I can get away from a crowd sure. to talk to them. Also, I love, it's something about these type of um, conventions that the lectures are a bit more intellectual. And I don't, I'm not, please don't say, he was talking about SAM, IBM, and all the big ones. That's right. not what I'm saying. It, it is a, a better chance for a more intimate discussion and and um, a about sharing. what's important yes and some of the things of psychology and philosophy are just really great and it doesn't have to be that like um marx marx driving yeah, like, right oh my goodness today he, he said i'm just giving you things but he didn't just give things the history he didn't just give you an effect he told you when it was done who did it how many people did it what you might be able to do with it and it just goes to a different level that as an uh, arts educator mm -hmm. and performer which i'm fortunate to be it just hits all the buttons for me. Um, I'm just digging this. I dub dig the sincerity of Vince, Vince Wilson. Uh, and folks out there, if you oppose magic, this is really a wonderful experience. I'm enjoying it so much. So much. It really is. And if you're coming necessarily just to learn trick after trick and to buy whatever the newest thing is that uh, Murphy's has or Vanishing right. Inc. or some of these, right. this is not the sort of this, convention you for you. You don't want to be here for no. that. And once again, Scott nor I, we're not, because you know how people are, we're not saying don't do Murphy's or P1 or anything. Because There's something for everybody. I, something it's, for everyone. Like Eugene says, it's a big house, a lot of rooms. Yeah, he said, I quote that all the time. He yeah. said, the house of magic has many rooms. Rooms for everyone. You know, and, and that's what it was like. Many rooms in the house of magic. Mm -hmm. That's what he says. Yeah. And that's what it should be. Because I deal with pain when I order from them in Murphy's and all, all these things. But this is what I like. I also don't mind saying this is also uh, in terms of the magic community. Here and the invocation are the places I feel most comfortable doing what I do for the general public. Yeah. Because so many magicians, and I'm not against, once again, I'm not against this, just not me, feel there must be trick after trick after trick after trick after trick. And as soon as you get out there on the stage, you need to do something within X number of seconds, but that's not what I do. Yeah. Um, a show that I did for a long time and still do, uh, my alter ego, Prince Juni, he mm -hmm. would go and do performances for people and he would it might be 45 minutes into the show a 45 minute to an hour show so i would always do what i call a special effect near the end of it mm -hmm. but people always refer to me as a magician it's because the whole thing is magical which is similar to what's going to happen tonight i'm so excited i'm excited about to see your what, show. what i'm doing tonight <laughs> yeah. well, brother i tell you it is great to see you i'm so glad that we could kind of reconnect over here oh, and man, uh, thanks for your comments pleasure man <laughs> just being in your presence is a pleasure you your energy has always been so good you're looking 
doing good, man, and, and keep doing what you're doing. As I told you last night, and I'll stop talking in a moment, I loved your writing, and I'm so happy to see you take this journalistic thing into the 21st century. Transitioning is what yeah. I'm doing. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And I think that's important, again, like we were just talking about, of trying something new. And I, I don't like to get stuck in the past yes. with things. I look at something new every day, and how can I perhaps evolve into something that uh, people are doing, yes. want to see and hear, yes, rather sir. than just being this old guy. Yes, you know? sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Love you so All much, right. Love you too, man. So with the Magic Word Podcast, that was Hiawatha. This is Scotty Al. We continue on this uh, third day of Poe's Magic Conference. I want to talk with someone who has been an integral part of a lot of these, I guess we would say, presentational or storytelling or bizarre types of conferences, and someone who has uh, been attending uh, many of these and been a performer and lecturer himself, uh, past, past CEO of uh, CNN, in fact. Here he is, Rolando Santos. Hey there, Rolando. Hey, Scott. How are you doing? <laughs> Fantastic. So you're not presenting this time, or are you performing or doing anything special this time? Well, no, this time I'm, I've got... Uh, I've Just MC, I, No, I emceed a panel, and uh, now I'm the official photographer for the event, okay. so I'm kind of behind <laughs> the scenes on this one. Uh, you know, it's interesting because... Um, there is an evolution that's happening from what used to be bizarre magic, okay? Mm -hmm. Bizarre magic in the traditional sense used to be heavily occult overtones, right? Dark. Yes, dark. That's a good word for it. And now it's moving along on a path that most of us are calling mystery entertainment. I like that better. And mystery entertainment is telling interesting stories around magic, Yes, there is some spiritualism involved, there is some seance involved, there is uh, psychic entertainment involved, right? Mm -hmm. But the heavy overtones that I think most magicians are used to when they say bizarre are those trappings really have kind of fallen apart, and you see more and more mainstream photographers doing this storytelling. Not photographers. Yeah, photographers. I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, man, magicians. Uh, I'm, oh yeah, I guess what's on my mind, taking yeah, exactly. pictures at the different events. I'm so sorry. Um, mainstream um, <laughs> magicians um, doing a little bit of mentalism, doing a little bit more storytelling. Yes, the card tricks are still there, the coin tricks are still there, and should be, because that's mm -hmm. all part of our art. Right. But now you see more hints of stories that are attached to them. Mm -hmm. um, making it more relevant and, and something that resonates within the minds of the volunteer audience. Yes, yes. Actually, um, I think what it does is it enhances that moment where you're forgetting about everything else that may be going on in the world, mm -hmm. right? And that's not a political statement. There's right. just a lot of stuff that's going on in the world, Correct. right? Correct. And, and in your personal lives as well. And in personal lives, exactly. And this really puts you in a place where you can forget about it for a half an hour. Magic has always done that to one degree or another. Mm -hmm. But if you really think back, most of the most revered magicians mm -hmm. always had a story that was attached, whether it was a grand illusion or something close up and near you, intimate, right? right? Air mm -hmm. intimate. And so I think that we're kind of going full circle and the evolution of bizarre magic is going. Now this particular event has really helped push that evolution along. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. When you talk about the older times, let's say with Tony Andruzzi and uh, yeah. uh, those types of things, I wouldn't say they were satanic, but some people might have had, some people who were from the outside might have seen it as that way and saying, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And that's not at all what it was. And certainly it has evolved to something, I wouldn't say it's more for kids' parties necessarily, but this is more adult themed, if you will, from the standpoint that it's for people who are your thinking audiences rather than someone who's there to just have bubblegum for the eyes. Yeah, I think that what used to be the occult overtones that were darker, yeah, and certainly the symbolo gothic, symbology maybe? was there. No, no, gothic was gothic was soft. There was no question that there were satanic imagery and things like that that created a shock value, right? right? True, true. Yeah. And those trappings have fallen apart. Now, some people, you know, may have believed that those things were true, and it wasn't. It, it was showmanship. It was just a very heavy-handed kind of showmanship that shocked group you. Might have done right. That, yeah. 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 Uh, and now you have more lighthearted, entertaining kind of stories about life and 
and things and events. And sure, there are plenty of ghost stories and um, seance-themed shows that you can go to. But even those are no longer as sinister as the word to, to use, yes. right? And they're right. no longer as sinister as it used to be. Um, I, uh, there, <laughs> there would have been a time, I think, where I wouldn't have brought my wife, Pam, mm-hmm. to uh, a bizarre convention. Uh, it's just, it's just no way that she would have understood that it's theater and all this other stuff, right? And this is a good group of people that we've known each other for a long time. Right. We've had a lot of fun. Um, this morning we had a couple of lectures. Um, Mark I want to talk about that a little bit. Go ahead and talk oh about that. Oh, my this. gosh. Yeah. Mark Strivings today did a lecture. And instead of theory and tricks, he just showed techniques. Mm-hmm. Just little snippets of techniques. And it's up to you to or do what you we may want already to do. know. Yeah, I I don't have been think, around since 1919 or something. I don't th- yeah, actually, the whole history of them. <laughs> I don't think there's anything that we saw this morning that a mainstream magician would not benefit from having. You no, know, that's a good that. point. That's a good point. Yep. I mean, think about it. Mm-hmm. All of those things. I mean, he did show a couple of things like, you know, how to do table wrapping and things like that. Sure. that but you put that aside. There's card effects. There was a mentalism effect in there. Um, there was a couple of fun pieces that you can just do kind of as a, as a prank. I mean, mm-hmm. I, yes, I, it's changed so much, and for the better, I think. Last evening we had uh, Joe Daniels who was talking uh, and gave uh, three tricks. And then this morning Mark said, I'm going to show you 38 tricks. <laughs> yeah. Now, yes, exactly. Now, what Mark did actually was he didn't go through 38 yeah. presentations. What he did was he took small techniques like the Mexican jumping bean, which I thought was hilarious. Great idea. Right? <laughs> um, I hadn't thought about that, putting it into a living or dead test or no, something. No, yeah. exactly. And so um, what he basically did was use a Mexican jumping bean to make a piece of paper jump up and out of all these other papers, right? Uh, and it just, just little tips like that. And then yesterday we had some amazing theory of how to engage an audience, which, as you know, it's my specialty being a journalist um, right. for as long as I have. Um, and we were talking last night, all four of the speakers, myself included, yesterday, are all saying the same thing, but we approach it slightly different. And yet, if you look at it, we're all saying the same thing. So it's interesting because I'm thinking to myself, if you didn't get it the way I presented it, Maybe the way Kenton presented it, or maybe the way Jeff presented it, mm, and certainly point. the way Eugene presented it, right? Mm-hmm. So now there is more of a chance that you're going to be able to see something and say, oh, that's what that means. Yes. Right? Yeah, and, and also the lectures or workshops tend to build on each other. For example, when there were, one was talking this morning, uh, Mark was talking about uh, ashes on the palm, and then later, of course, uh, Peter Samuelson is talking about that. He's saying, you know, don't worry about trying to tip something I'm going to be talking about because my presentation and what I'm talking about is completely different, so we're building on all that then, too. Right. So you're, it's the themes are there, but how you accomplish those things are different for each of us. I engage an audience... Um, through my voice, through the way I handle them, through years of broadcasting and, and living through and reporting live from shootings and earthquakes and things like that. So I, I tend to evoke a connection with an audience. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's what, right. I, that's what I do. As opposed to provoke a reaction. And, and the way I define it is I can evoke a reaction that becomes a memory, whereas when you provoke a reaction, it's a transitory moment. Both can be entertaining, It's just, do you want that lasting memory, or do you want that fleeting moment of entertainment? Well, that's the way I approach it. Yet, Kenton says the same thing. What are you looking for? Are you looking for something where the person walks away with something long-lasting, or do you want something in the moment, and you approach it this way or this way? And so we're both saying the same thing, just different ways. It sounds like you might have a lecture in there somewhere. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and you might think the, about coming and giving that to the TAOM in a couple actually, of weeks. Actually, I think, uh, <laughs> wow, you're a mentalist. I, you know you're, you know what's happening in the future in two oh, weeks. That's happen. pretty good. <laughs> uh, 
uh, yeah. Uh, for those those of you who are attending the Texas Association of Magicians Convention, and this is another minor part that there are some other people who are members of the TAOM who also are members of the Order of Willard, meaning you have 25 years of service or more. And Rolando is going to be our guest speaker. So, uh, what he's talking about, we will be sharing with you in an upcoming episode. So, stay tuned for that. Another thing is talking about this being a family, and it certainly is because everybody is knows each other and it's kind of fun. There's only, what, about 50 or so of us uh, here, who are here. And you talked about uh, Eugene Berger a little bit earlier. It does feel like that he's here because there have been so many references, certainly with, with uh, Jeff being here and people you know, doing his voice and saying, as Eugene would say, or as Eugene would say, or as Eugene would say, he's here. You, <laughs> exactly. And he lives on through all of us. I don't, I don't believe that there is a lecturer here hmm. And I'd say probably more than half of the performers that he has not touched in some way, Mm -hmm. uh, either through his writings, through his books, or more directly through, in my particular case, I mean, he was my mentor, I mean, physically my mentor, where we discussed my persona and who I was going to be. And uh, This is a good example. Getting back to what you were asking about, there would have been a time when my persona would have been that of a historian, or it would have been maybe a uh, person who has lived a hundred years, and I'm, mm-hmm. but I'm hiding that, right? Or, or as a, just a plain wizard, right? Right. And yet, I ended up being none of those things. I ended up being exactly what I am—a journalist who's traveled the world for the last forty-eight year or forty-eight years, and, and some strange and things. And I've you seen learned, yeah. some things that have fascinated me, terrified yeah. me, and mystified me. And I'm going to share that. Well. Great. That wouldn't have happened in the old bazaar. The old bazaar oh, would have had me in uh, dark robes or yeah. would have had me in a dark suit and I would have been somewhat sinister because I'm, I'm trying to give the impression that I'm really a secret immortal mm-hmm. and that I have all this knowledge and mm-hmm. stuff, right? right? That's an example of how the genre has changed. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And that's kind of why I think people need to know about this so they can kind of join us, if you will, uh, and not be afraid of thinking it because they might have an outdated opinion of what it was. Right, and not be afraid to hire a mystery entertainer for a cocktail party and say, he's going to come in here and we're going to have some fun and you know, some candles are going to float here and there may be flame appearing from nowhere and this and the other, but it's not going to be someone conjuring up you know, evil spirits. Right, right. Well, I know one of your mentors was Ed Solomon, who went by Denomalos, yeah. and he, his was perhaps more of the older school where you typically have flames or, or kind of a ritualistic type of a thing. I Have you ever seen, did you ever watch Ed perform like a full evening show or anything? Oh, of course. I, in fact, what was that like? when, when, when Ed um, passed, I actually edited his column for five years for the Linking Ring. Mm-hmm. And during that time, we got to know each other. And so when he passed away, he bequeathed the name and the brand because he knew that I could write in that particular voice. Mm -hmm. Um, It's interesting because Ed could take it way out there and be dark. Yeah. And yet most of his stories were fables with a moral to them. That's a good point. Yes, it did. You know, Mm -hmm. it's amazing. They have this image of Ed because he was part of the original crowd, the Andrusi crowd and all Mm -hmm. the originators of Bizarre Magic. And they have him in a, you know, in a cowl and in a robe and a hooded robe. And it it makes you feel like he was sinister. And yet, Mm -hmm. in fact, I have... You know all his writings from the from the beginning to the very end, and if you read through them, almost all of them are, 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 are morals or fables. Mm-hmm. Um, Things he was trying to teach or get yeah, across through his exactly, magic, basically. Exactly, and mm-hmm. not necessarily. Um, man, out of all his stuff, maybe one percent was really dark and sinister. Yeah. Do you think people can today, with short attention spans, want to? continue to watch like a let's say a 90 minute presentation of something that would be i wouldn't say dark and sinister but perhaps something that is uh oriented towards the bizarre more than ever more than ever because if you tell the story the right way they're going to get lost in the story with you which goes to what i'll be talking about at taom right right right. Right. and and as a reporter as a reporter i can tell you that the longest 130 in your life is a badly written script on a, on a newscast. And right. the fastest half hour of your life is a well-written documentary. And there are a lot of people who do watch just news programs hour upon hour, and they're doing that because they are interested in what's happening. So you got a very good point. If people are telling a well-written story, half they an hour watch. will fly by, uh, and you okay. won't even know you. there's a half hour. That was brilliant. By. Well yet put. If, yet if you have a minute 30 
and that story drags. It's it the like longest <laughs> minute thirty can seem like an hour. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And that's what we that's what we get together to try and achieve. To right. share the techniques and the secrets of presenting something that is entertaining so that the audience can lose themselves and before they know it, forty five minutes have gone by and they go home feeling great. Yeah. You ought to be a commercial for this uh, conference. Well, That's great. I just, That's exactly I just believe well in what I'm doing. Yeah. I mean, no, of yeah. course you do. And, you know, yeah. magic is that. I mean, take mm-hmm. away the bizarre. When it's all said and done, we all became magicians to make a difference in the world. I've seen you True. perform. Yep. When you perform, it's beautiful. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I forget whatever else is going on, and I'm just there in that yeah. moment. Well, you don't do bizarre. Mm-hmm. You do traditional magic, right. although you do do some right. storytelling. Right. 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 Um, and so it doesn't... Magic... Storytelling is no different than any other kind of magic. I want you to, for a few moments, just live this magical moment with me. Mm-hmm. Well put. Rolando, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So for the Magic Word Podcast, here from Poe's Magic Conference, that was Rolando Santos, Scotty Allen. We just finished having a very interesting conversation, or I should say discussion or presentation about seances, uh, as presented by Terry Tyson, I That's believe correct. it is. That's yeah. right. And I've got with me right now Kenton Nepper, Knepper, sorry, Kenton Nepper, <laughs> Knepper, <laughs> Kenton Nepper, the K is silent. So yes, it should it be Enton Eb Nepper, right? Yes, that's right. Although, 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 listen, <laughs> Luke Tremay even said Kenton Knepper more than once, so it's okay. <laughs> Who was one of the presenters then yesterday then as well, and that was a really uh, interesting uh, conversation. So I'm glad you presented that. Yeah. Yeah, we had a great, we had a great long conversation yesterday mm-hmm. about really getting to the heart of things, of what our characters are for real, and being mm-hmm. uh, integrating who and what we are into whatever we do, whether and it's what magic I or mental. Was great. We was, first of all said this is going to take two hours, and yeah. I'm sure people are squirming their seats saying, "I'm going to be here for two, two hours? hours," and it flew by. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, everybody not a, not a single yawn, which was no. always nice. Nobody uh, left. Nobody <laughs> left. Nobody <laughs> left at all. They hung in there. We didn't really do too many tricks. No. It was all about. Uh, deeper things, but mm-hmm. uh, we changed a lot of hearts and minds, I think, and uh, mm-hmm. magic and mentalism is better for it, and I'm all for that. So that's, and that's the idea. Part of this is from, or much of it is from your, your tome, your what yes. is that, a thousand word uh, page book? It's, or? it's only 800 pages. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the new Kenton Principles book just came out. Um, and, yeah, a lot of the talk was based on a very small part of what's in Kenton Principles. Talk basically or briefly about that and also yeah. where people can get a copy of it. Sure. Uh, well, you can get a copy of it uh, right now from wonderwizards.com, which has been my website for quite some time. Mm-hmm. It just came out. Uh, Kenton Principles is a combination of a lot of my different principles throughout the years, as well as some updated uh, material and principles. And the idea is basically... To learn principles so you can do anything you want, right? It's one thing to learn like 50 tricks, um, and there are a lot of tricks in this book, but it's it's not just trick-based. It's getting principles so you can say, oh, now that I understand the principle, I can apply it to and do all sorts of things. Sure. You know, the simple example would be, hey, I learned how to palm a coin. Well, okay, that means I can do... Lots of different tricks, right? Mm-hmm. The right. same is true psychologically. If you understand a certain principle psychologically, you can say, oh, well, I can make all sorts of things happen with that. And so that's what Kenton Principles is about. Or if you want a routine, make a routine where people always say, be more meaningful. Well, how the hell do you do that, right? Mm-hmm. And Kenton Principles teaches you simply how to do all those things. Much like psychological subtleties. To begin with, that just right. tells you some principles that you could apply then. Then subtleties two and three, of course, were like with you and others who have right. taken those principles and made something out of it. Yeah, right. So where psychological principles was okay, but well, here's how to you know, make people think certain things. Kenton Principles is really about, I want to learn how to routine things better or I want to figure out how to do something that makes a lasting impression on Mm -hmm. somebody how do I do that Um, or I want to make what I want to say be interesting to other people all those kind of things are really important to us right and that's what Kent Principles teaches you how to do but in easy ways Um, so it's it's really oh well it's just that that's all I have to do yeah Yeah. right Yeah. and once you get that and that's what part of the talk was yesterday right let's talk about something stupid and make it important 
Um, you know, how yes. do we do that? Oh, we can do that in two steps. Okay, done. <laughs> right? The, that, that's what it's about. That was pretty much the bottom line. I kind of got out of that. It was like things are much more simple than what we were trying to make them overly difficult. And that yeah. they can be a lot easier. And different things you're saying, like with your body language and everything also, where you're kind of looking off of the distance or right. something. And, and, and anyhow, it was phenomenal. Yes, yeah, yeah. So the more people get these little tidbits of parts of principles, they can say, okay, now I can go off and do all sorts of nonsense. No wonder, you know, people say, oh, well, Kent must be difficult. It must be hard to learn. No, no it's not. It's really, <laughs> really not. Um, you know, but because there's so much depth to what I do, people think that means it's difficult. It's right. really not. Once you know how to do it, it's not at all. Once you got the principle. That's right. Once you got the principle. Why is it that you came to this particular convention? Because I don't see you a lot of times. We were talking earlier on the elevator. Right. About, yeah, yeah you know. we haven't seen each other for a while. So, well, you know, my thing is I go to, uh, I have lots of friends. I don't need to go to conventions to see, see my friends. So uh, I go to conventions where I'm going to teach something to people who are ready to learn what I have to teach. Um, again, not that it's difficult, but hey, if you want to see 50 ways to do a double lift, I'm not the guy, right? right. <laughs> so, right. so I end up going to places where they go, you know what, our crowd really needs you. Um, and then, hey, if that works out, then that's that's where I go. So that's why I'm here. You know, it was a perfect group because, as we just talked about, everyone was really here to learn and listen and yeah. and benefit from all this. Right? Yeah. yeah. So um, I I was told the group would be very uh, open minded and listening, yeah. and they really absorbed it and started putting it to use right away. So that's yeah, that's why I was here. Good. I'm glad you were. Thanks, Kenton, very much. Always great. To Wish see you. you good luck. Thank you so much. <laughs> Always great to see you, my friend. So for the Magic Word podcast, that was Kenton Nepper, Scotty. Allen. We have just finished and closed out the uh, full evening show here today and actually closed out day number three. We only have one more day to go. And uh, we also had just an excellent uh, uh, lecture this afternoon by a gentleman I'm going to talk to right now who also closed tonight's gala show, Mr. Peter Samuelson. Hello, Peter. Hello. I haven't seen you since FISM. It has been it has days. Been, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> really, but a lot of water under that bridge since then. So, yeah. Oh, yes. Well, speaking of which, you were across the pond. I was. Tell us a little I, was about in Ireland. I was in Ireland because my partner Karen is over there doing an artisan residency program in collage and photography. She's doing amazing, wonderful work. Mm -hmm. uh, she also has Irish citizenship, which is really lovely. Oh. And then I had traveled from Galway over to Dublin, spent a night with Pat Fallon, with Quentin Reynolds. Oh. Quentin hosted me for that, and yeah. that was just what a great evening that was. And then on to Holland, where I went to see Scott and Muriel, who were then performing uh, at, a, at a summer theme park that was a, a family park. And man, they put on an amazing show. They're just wow. world, they're world champions, obviously. Yes, right. so, you know, so. Wow, what a holiday you had after the great. holiday. And I flew home, and then the next day I drove down here. It's like, whoa, okay. <laughs> And from here, where do you go? So from here, I'm actually going back up to New Jersey. I've got a couple things to do. And then it turns out that I got a call just a couple days ago uh, to go to Liberty Magic once again. And I'll be there all of October. Mm -hmm. So back there for that. And uh, possibly a trip to Canada in the interim on that. And uh, we'll see what else is going well, on. Sounds like a good way of wrapping out the end of the year. It is indeed. It's going to be absolutely great. This has been an amazing, wonderful conference. It's been so great to see these wonderful lectures by the people that are here. Boy, what, a, what an array of talent we've got here. It, it is. And this is my first time I've been at this conference. I'm yeah. sure you as well. Yeah. And uh, may not be my last. I probably come back to this. Yeah, this is so much great. fun. Exactly. And as many people have been saying about how much of a family this is, and everybody's just really enjoying sharing it the way that we have. Do you remember, I don't know if you remember, but Magic in the Rockies had that same sort of feeling. that there was Missed real, that. I, oh, man. It was a maximum of 300 people, yeah. but everybody was just felt like they were part of this family. Yeah. yeah. Magic in the Rockies is not happening anymore. Right. So, I, you know, yeah. we'll see. Maybe, maybe this can pick up the... I was on the tail end of that, and I was talking with uh, Lou Weisman, Weiminster about that. Yes, and exactly. uh, Yeah. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, man. We just uh, This was the last year because I was planning yeah. on coming the next year. It was, just, <laughs> it, was, it was an amazing place, an amazing yeah. experience, and great people. I mean, absolutely amazing people. Well, you talk about up to 300 people. This only has about 50, 60 people. Exactly. So this is really what a tight. energy, exactly. Oh, oh my gosh. Exactly yeah. right. Everyone is interested in learning so much, and it's not like teach me a trick or what's the newest no. thing that somebody's no. selling, you know. 
exactly. No, this and, and like I said, the lectures were at a level which wasn't just, oh, here's a bunch of dealer items. Mm-hmm. It was really an intellectual thought. I mean, it really, there was a lot of thought. And the fabulous thing was, you know, because Kent and Nepper lectured and Mark Strivings and Jeff lectured, McBride lectured, and I did a lecture, mm-hmm. and, uh, and Joseph Daniels did a lecture. I mean, just, it's incredible. I, I'm forgetting some people here. I'm so sorry. But the lectures all seem to sort of mesh together. It's right. like multiple ways of looking at the same problem. How do you make theatrical events meaningful and touch people and actually have some power and presentation and aren't just long stories but actually you know connect and, and two good examples uh, a couple that you were i think going to come up with one was uh, terry tyson who was doing the same exactly, exactly it was amazing right. yeah, yeah, and yeah. then professor jb i think it is and his presentation as a uh, victorian englishman telling a story with a trick that the trick was incidental to his performance oh my yeah. gosh he was yeah. fantastic yeah <laughs> So it was just this, uh, uh, just amazing, and now we're sort of hanging out at the end of the show, and tomorrow so is going to be an amazing day. Let's talk about the show. Okay. I mean, yeah, <laughs> okay. you close the sure. thing yeah. to a standing ovation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, so, you know, this is a piece that actually I began working with with Hiawatha years ago, So and he hasn't seen it for a couple of years. I, and what I went, was his comment? So Oh, he was just thrilled. He was just absolutely thrilled. Because I went and I, I spent some time, uh, with Leland Faulkner working on this as well, and we worked on some script on this, and then the final music, which really gets people up on their feet. Well, Levent and I were talking about this piece, and he said, I've got a piece of music for you that fits right in. I went, oh, yeah. my gosh, it actually does. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's just this collaboration with lots of people, and I love working that way. I have seen little bits and pieces of this that you have presented at previous conventions, yep. but I love the way this has come together. What is it, a 15, 20-minute yeah, like piece or so? Yeah, minutes, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. uh, what I was thinking. And But it, it moves along, and it, there's, it's so multi-layered. And, uh, and there's gets, a fair amount of magic that happens oh my goodness, in this thing, yes, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some, solid, some solid stuff going on in there. And just the scripting on this is great, and, yeah, and the props thanks, that you're using that are original props that you obviously yeah. you've made are yeah. amazing. And so, so the, this whole idea, speaking of Magic in the Rockies, this is how this conversation is coming full circle again. Yeah. So at Magic in the Rockies many years ago, Leland and I were sitting down, and I'd been doing some close-up stuff where I use this little string pipe that happens in there, and it's a kid's toy that I start out with. And he said, oh, oh I know I, I remember you doing They blow the thing, and it, exactly. keeps, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it keeps spinning. Like right, right. Yeah, exactly. So, and Leland said, well, I have a piece I'm working on. I said, what is it? He said, with X-ray specs. I said, well, tell me about that. That was and your so, promo picture. <laughs> I, well, no, this was way back oh, when. Oh, this okay. was before I'd even started doing this. Yeah. And it was his idea to be using the X-ray specs and the basic structure mm-hmm. of some of the trick part of it. Mm-hmm. Not to turn it into the church, but to do that. And, yeah. uh, and then I had to, I was down with my friend Steve Bedwell in Florida, and I was playing with this idea. And, you know, and uh, T.C. Tahoe said, uh, said, oh, you know, you should really use this gag of, you know, is it better one or is it better two? Or that, that was hilarious. It is. I mean, it's, so this is almost a throwaway. There's so many different gags in there. You know, yeah. as, as Jeff said, it's, uh, people are laughing so hard, sometimes they may miss how strong the magic was. Well, when you so. open up that big comic book and the light was shining on you, it's just like some of the pictures that you'd seen some, in some graphic novels of a kid who's, oh, I see the light now. Exactly <laughs> right. So this has been... You know, so it was Magic in the Rockies where the original concept happened on this sort of stuff with Leland, and then we came back together again after working with Hiawatha, and just so now here we are. You know, at a, at a piece that's really. We well, mentioned Hiawatha. Now, some of the people. Who, now, what was the lady's name? Who was the uh, MC? Uh, I can't think of her name. Uh, yeah, sorry, Scepter. Yeah. Uh, Sister Scepter, I believe. Uh, so, and, and she was good and kept the thing uh, moving along. I'm trying to think. There are so many different people who were in this. I believe we start, start off with Joe. Uh, and then, uh, oh, goodness, I'm going to forget so many. We, we probably had, what, ten people, I guess. I know that. Uh, At least. And Vince Wilson, Vince Wilson came out, who was, uh, you know, one of the people's here. And Adam, Vlad was here. Vlad was and, here. You know, Adam Stone. And, Kent, and Adam Stone did yep, this. Yep, Kent Nepper. Uh, right. Was in it. And Jeff McBride. Uh, and Susan. Uh, that's right. Susan did a uh, piece in there yep. as well. And... Um, Golly, I, it was just uh, multi-talented and multifaceted. And what was it? I mean, it was about a three-hour show. Or? <laughs> what time is it now? It's getting to be, uh, uh, yeah, it's 11.45. Yeah, right it, was, it must have been about three hours. Well, there was an intermission. Let's, let's be clear. That's right. That's right. Exactly. It, was, it was really great. And, hey, Vince, Vince, come here a second. I got uh, Vince Wilson going to ask him. He can probably give us a quick lowdown since he's the producer of this show. He's the uh, guy who put it all That's together. right. Just, what was the lady's name who was uh, the MC of the show tonight? 
And it's Crystal Young Love. She goes to, uh, sometimes by the name of Crystal Strange Love as well. Okay. And so we're just trying to do a quick uh, rundown of the people who are in the show. So Joe Daniels. Okay, yeah. Uh, Joe da- Joseph Daniels and then uh, had Vlad and... Christopher Taylor Christopher was... Taylor. Jeff McBride, you might have heard of him. That's yeah, right. exactly right. <laughs> That's right. Kent Nepper, Hiawatha Johnson Jr. That was, that was actually one of the highlights for me this evening. Oh, my gosh. That was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I think we've covered just about everybody. We had, uh, yeah, Vlad and... Uh, Susan Zeller. Yep, Susan. Yeah, Susan Zeller was also here. We had uh, yeah, Crystal... Was the, Adam Stone the, was in there. Adam Stone, the, that's right. right. Yep, Adam yep, Stone. Yep, yep, yep. One of our guys here at Pose. Right. He's yes. actually one of my students uh, with Pose Magic Theater here and Pose Magic Academy. Mm-hmm. And, of course, Terry Tyson. Absolutely. You know, the, yeah, the master ghost host maestro of the spiritual himself. Exactly. That's right. We were just mentioning that he did such a great lecture earlier with the seance. The seance today. That was really great. Oh, my gosh. We're going to be doing that again tomorrow night since it was kind of late tonight. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, the, uh, the, i got to tell you, the all the lectures and workshops were amazing. Every Nothing but compliments, nothing negative at all this whole weekend. Mm-hmm. Absolutely phenomenal. It's like it's amazing. Uh, it's it's got to be one of the most amazing uh uh, conf- I'm not I'm biased, of course. The most amazing <laughs> conferences I've ever been to. It, but the thing is, like I always, yeah, the, the uh, seance will be tomorrow night instead because this is going long. But I do want to say this. You know, one of the great things about these conferences, and, and you guys can speak from experience, when you go to a lot of these, the speakers go off to the rooms or they meet in a green room somewhere, and there's not a lot of mingling and interaction. You know, what we, one of the things we pride on at Post Magic Conference is no matter how big a, or well known someone is, they're going to be down hanging out with everyone. You get to be. Yeah, that's right. Isn't that wonderful? It's not by contract. It's because you want to be. Yeah, that's right. Yep, exactly. You get to you get to mingle and hang out with everyone. You get to be around these celebrities of magic, these big names like Peter Sam. Like Peter, I tell you, I, I love Peter. You know, he's been such a good friend. I was, and somebody I admire. You know, I was, so I was, I was Yeah, I was really. Yeah, I really thought that Jeff should close tonight, and Jeff said, I want to close the first act. It's what I'm doing these days. He said, I've closed lots of gala shows. Your turn. I went, okay, all right, all right, I'll do it. Yeah, it was well rounded. It was well produced. Exactly. I thought the way that it flowed. He came up to me afterward and said, that was the best closure we could have had tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Very well done. Good job in putting it together, Vince. Thank you very much. Good job in everything you that you've done then. And won't be long. Yeah, we got another day to go of this. Exactly right. So for the Magic Word Podcast, that's Peter Samuelson and also the organizer, Fitz Wilson, Scotty out. See you tomorrow.